All right, I think I will get started. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nicolas Bous. I'm director of operation engineering at uh, Adobe uh, for the Adobe Advertising Cloud. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about our uh, OpenStack journey and what led us to uh, uh, cloud bursting and uh, all this uh, exciting st uh, stuff. So first, let me introduce uh, briefly what, what is Adobe Advertising Cloud. And it's, it's really the, the industry first, uh, the, the industry first uh, end to end, end platform um, that uh, allows you to manage uh, uh, advertising from a traditional TV uh, to any di digital format. It really makes it uh, simple to deliver uh, uh, video, display, search advertising across any screen and uh, in any uh, format. And what I want to talk about specifically today is one part that is called uh, programmatic ad buying. Um, so that's one specific part that uh, came up over the years, uh, and that's really what this platform is, is about and what this talk is going to, uh, to discuss. Um, so originally, like most of the ad on this industry has been bought through like a complex manual process, RFP, IOs, and you can see the uh, the sales guy is doing like a bunch of facts and trying to get uh, um, inventory on some website and sell that to some clients. And, and even so, the, the ad delivery was like um, in, in some way uh, uh, automated. Uh, there are still like a very uh, EV sales process going on. Nowadays, it's uh, 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 fully um, uh, software based, and, and you can see that as a stock marketplace where you go on a website, you have a video. Well, the, the ad you may see on this uh, before seeing your video is going to be a, a real time uh, bidding process where um, a, a different service will be called and tell us, like, oh, there is this user going to see this video. And you have to make the decision in process to say, like, okay, I want to bid on this. I want to bid on this user and I want to show this specific ad. Um, and uh, depending on your bid, depending on the competition, you may win or lose uh, the auction. It's, it's very transformative. It does mean like uh, uh, there is a lot going on nowadays on, on, uh, on all those platforms. Um, and what, what it means is a lot of uh, exciting technical change for us. Uh, one of them is uh, definitely latency. Um, you, you have to be able to uh, deliver um, and, and make your decisioning process in, in a few milliseconds. Uh, 99, uh, 95 generally on like 50 milliseconds. Uh, so you have enough room for network or things like that. Um, but so it, it does uh, put some uh, uh, different challenge on what you are doing. It's also high volume traffic. Uh, we are processing uh, hundreds of billions of uh, requests every day. Uh, they, they are really like all, all those uh, uh, web requests we are getting from uh, uh, that, that get transformed like in uh, ad auction. Uh, and all those ad auctions are coming to us and we have to make decisions like do we want to bid or not? Do we care about this user? Do we have like an ad to show to this user or not? Uh, and to make our decision, we have to store like huge data set. We have a lot of information, a lot of uh, objects to store, a billion of objects. Uh, you can see that as uh, cookies or device ID and things like that that are used to allow us to, uh, to target user to decide in which segment you may, you may be in and which, which ad will be the most relevant to you. Uh, so all this like presents like a uh, new set of challenge to uh, be able to provide um, uh, a relevant ad uh, quickly to the user. Um, and we started all that in, in public cloud. And, and public cloud can be uh, very helpful, but it can be very annoying too. Uh, as you grow, as you have to manage such a huge volume, uh, controlling costs become a real pain. Uh, each uh, cloud provider may have different way of uh, measuring costs. You may have like a hard time to build like a, a relevant projection. It, it can get very cumbersome. Uh, and you lose uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, visibility and technical limitation on our, our performance. Uh, you kind of have to do a lot of iteration to understand like packet per second limitation or, or uh, any uh, uh, resource uh, stole, stole by a noisy neighbor or thing like that. Um, and especially if there is any incident or network problem or stuff like that, it may become like uh, even more harder to troubleshoot and, and try to analyze. Um, and, and then from there, it kind of become a, a blame, blame game between your provider and yourself and trying to figure out like what is the, the best strategy. Like uh, uh, there was an outage, you, you suffer from it. It's like, oh, but you're not like multi-region, multi multi-region. 
you can't necessarily do that in all use cases. Um, if, if you are dependent on latency, you can't uh, easily think about multi-region, for example. So you need to find solutions to those problems, how you can still serve your business, uh, but considering some of the limitations you may have. Private cloud rocks. I mean, you are in control of everything. Um, <laughs> you know everything. And uh, you perform the best. Uh, at least that's what you want from a private cloud. Uh, so you may start looking at private cloud, and that's where you want to be. Um, and, and that's very uh, uh, natural uh, thinking process. You, you can think you can do better. Um, but the reality is that you, you will most likely end up with some hybrid cloud that, that where you try to leverage like what you are building in ours. You have some data center, uh, bare metal deployment. You have some uh, solution on, uh, on a public cloud uh, provider. And you, you try to leverage, like depending on the use case, you try to leverage the best solution uh, for, uh, for each platform. And you may end up with like a very siloed uh, infrastructure that may become like hard to manage, uh, may work for some use case, but, but it, it become, as your platform grows, it's become um, less obvious that you, you benefit of each solution and you have like a really uh, um, uh, standardized infrastructure and, and automated infrastructure. So with private cloud, there is some, uh, some uh, scaling challenge that came uh, to it. Um, and the obvious one is like you can't uh, scale quickly enough. Uh, you, you have your hardware, you have uh, bare metal, you, you end up having like, uh, you, you don't have the same flexibility as doing an API call and, and getting like a, a bunch of like hundred or thousand of, uh, of VM provision for you. Uh, so it's, it, it's become a, a new, uh, a new problem or old problem if you were already in a data center before. Um, and, and if you mess that up, it's really impact your stability and your growth. Uh, and that's something you don't necessarily want to trade on. So uh, from there, you, you obviously want to implement cloud bursting. That is like what, what could be the natural uh, thought to, uh, um, to have. Like, uh, okay, I have my uh, core in house, I have uh, all this uh, bare metal server, I, I have built my private cloud, but I still want to be able to burst some workload because I have seasonal traffic or things like that. Um, so you want cloud bursting to quickly overflow your comp uh, compute resources uh, on public cloud, whatever is a public cloud you choose. Uh, that will help you mitigate like uncontrolled peak of, uh, of traffic, seasonal uh, traffic and things like that. And it will give you some buffer for uh, procurement delay. So you still want to have your core in house, but you know that it may take like three months, six months, uh, depending on the market. If you have like SSDs that are like out of stock or whatever, uh, so you, you have to factor all these details that are like complicated and annoying and the business doesn't really care about that if you, you have to deliver a service. Um, so the buffer is useful, but that's not that easy to do. Um, and, and overflowing, is, uh, that, that's a picture of the Oroville Dam in California. I don't know if you, you follow this story, but they, 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 after like 60 years or something like that, that's the first time they use this uh, uh, spillway. Uh, and it's kind of a disaster. Uh, and it, it's very hard to build right. It's, it's not uh, something you want to use all the time. It's really like your safety, uh, uh, your safety net in some way. And it can be very costly to operate. Uh, or, or at least at the beginning, you think it's a good option, but then you, you can realize that uh, it, it's not that cheap to, uh, to operate. So what I'm going to do is to go a little bit more inside our uh, journey and what we did, what, what bring us uh, uh, to do a cloud bursting with the advertising cloud. Um, and, and to us, it's really a journey about uh, infrastructure automation. It's more than just OpenStack or cloud bursting or, or private versus public cloud. It's really how we automate our infrastructure and how we scale the service to uh, best serve our, our, our client. So the cloud journey started in 2011 with just an ideation uh, that was mostly driven by uh, cost and performance. And at the time, um, uh, public cloud was like definitely already a standard, uh, but there was a lot of uh, changes. Not everything was there. EBS was just starting to get there for Amazon. Um, th there was, a, I think VPC was not even there or just starting to be there. On the private cloud solution, there was a lot of uh, open source projects coming up, like Eucalyptus, OpenNebula, OpenStack, CloudStack. So everybody was thinking about it. 
And um, 2012, we tried to evaluate that. We were like more and more like excited about it because all the technical challenge we were facing and trying to address were with our public cloud provider. Uh, we were not able to address them in a meaningful way and we are still growing. Um, so we have been trying to evaluate uh, Eucalyptus and we were looking at uh, EC2 compatibility. The API uh, compatibility was very important for us at that time. Um, and, and the reality is that we were not able to do like uh, meaningful uh, uh, progress on, uh, on this. It does require a lot of effort. In 2013, we chose to have like some vendors helping us, um, trying to go on the Zynga model, uh, which was heavily based on a cloud stack at the time. Uh, but when we did that, that was kind of a big failure. We were not like very excited about what we were getting. We didn't see like any cost saving. We didn't see how we could get like the technical solution we were looking for. So there was no way we moved further on that. And, uh, and at the time, OpenStack tech, uh, took uh, more, um, the community was growing and there were like, like a real appeal to look at that, like uh, all this modularity of OpenStack gave us like the, the confidence that we could uh, probably find the technical solution we were looking for. So we started to look at that. 2014 was really the do-it-yourself. Uh, that's where we started to uh, design and build our infrastructure to fit our need. Um, and that's really what, what drives uh, the rest of the journey. It's how we build something that is meaningful for us and we had to stick to the core. Uh, we had challenge with like any uh, block storage solution. Um, but we went through this. Uh, when in 2015, we got our first uh, production cluster deployed. Uh, that was a make it work moment. Uh, there was definitely challenges. Um, but at, at the end, we were able to, uh, to, uh, to find like good success uh, in this deploy deployment, but we had to accept uh, some reality of this. Uh, we totally gave up on the EC2 compatibility. There was no real point for us to do that anymore. Um, having multiple API to deal with, uh, that's not that much a big deal. It's easy to automate, to, uh, to, uh, to build your wrapper or your tooling. And, and as, as the year goes on, um, you know that there is new tools that allow you to do that even more easily, like tools like uh, Terraform and things like that. Um, 2016, we grow even more. We added like three more data, uh, data center location. Uh, we spent a lot of time like scaling, automating, and, and, and we, we did a lot of iteration to really understand, like to improve the platform to make sure we can scale that. Um, and so we, we went through this journey with like some uh, very, uh, very specific philosophy. We, we are not an IT shop. We are not here to build an open stack solution we can resell to someone. Uh, that's not our core. Uh, business. Uh, at the time, Tumogul was a small startup growing fast. Uh, we are now part of the Adobe Advertising Cloud and, and, and supporting this, uh, this growth. Um, we, we had to, uh, to be very lean. Uh, we, we, had, like, we didn't have like 100 people to manage this solution. Uh, that came from like three people working together like overnight and trying to build like a solution that worked for our need. Um, so we were really like uh, uh, embracing this value of doing a lot with a little. And, and we didn't really care about what was nice to do, what was a fancy or last trending uh, option for, for OpenStack. That was really like how it's going to serve our problem and solve our problem. We wanted to really, really embrace the approach of like kettle and not pet. Uh, when we look at the infrastructure we want to deploy, we were not talking about deploying like two or three servers in a rack somewhere. Uh, we really took an approach of what we were designing was a full set of uh, full rags that we design uh, end to end and make sure that we, when we deliver the, to the data center, it's a full rack that is delivered. Um, with our minimum footprint was actually a uh, two rack uh, at the time. Um, and and that, that's a strong uh, commitment because it does mean like if, if our need was lower than this amount of server, then we will stick to a public cloud. Um, and, and that's very important. And the other element that uh, we keep uh, moving with is the continuous delivery aspect. Uh, we want to automate everything. Uh, being a lean operation team, being few people, we can't afford to not automate anything. We have to make things easy to uh, uh, rebuild, to repeat, to, uh, to iterate on. Uh, so everything is uh, needed to be um, automated. 
all our bare metal, all our OpenStack deployment is, is uh, uh, fully done, like for a push button, uh, almost uh, kind of deployment. What we have today is uh, six OpenStack locations. We, have in, we are in six geographic. Uh, and, and we have this multi-cloud kind of uh, philosophy where some of these uh, physical open, uh, OpenStack deployment are actually uh, um, uh, a mix of uh, uh, bare metal, OpenStack, and also like public cloud uh, pro, uh, solution where we, we really try to integrate all this together and take the best of uh, each world. And I'll get in a bit more detail soon. Some of the challenge with that is really that the long learning curve uh, that was needed. Uh, I think nowadays it's much easier because there is way more like collective knowledge on what can be done, how it can be done. Uh, but it's still like a huge uh, uh, learning curve, uh, especially to deploy like an open stack uh, infrastructure. The complexity of deployment, upgrade, or patching is also like a big, uh, big challenge. Uh, you, you really need to. Uh, put the necessary amount of effort to automate uh, from your uh, Pixie uh, deployment to, uh, to your uh, configuration management on OpenStack and, and the release or the management of your VM, all that needs to be uh, thought through. Uh, and the other challenge is that there is a lot of immature options. There is a lot of things that just doesn't work uh, or doesn't work for your use case. And that's where it's become very critical, like understanding your use case. So some stuff that we, we thought we wanted and we gave up on was the cloud API compatibility. Uh, in my opinion, it's something that is kind of an utopia and it's really not necessary. Um, I, uh, at the end, each, each cloud provider, each cloud solution has their own version, their own uh, tech on how to do things. Um, so trying to abstract that with a different API call kind of abstracts the performance or the challenge you will have at the end. Uh, so it's, in my opinion, it's just better to acknowledge that and deal with it. Um, you will have different behavior on different cloud providers, on your private solution, on your bare metal, on your VM, depending on how you configure them. You need to consider all those parameters. Um, and, and the big challenge for private deployment is really that there is not a, no mature on-premise block storage solution. Uh, unless you are going to buy something from a vendor or buy something expensive or uh, have like an army of people working on it to build something stable, uh, you will have a lot of challenge for that. So going through the journey for us was really to stick to the core of OpenStack, keep it simple. Uh, we couldn't afford to try to uh, build like a specific deployment to start looking at ironic or other stuff. It, it, it was not what we were trying to do. Um, having a simple network design to scale and innovate and iterate quickly, that was also like uh, critical to us. We leverage VLANs is, uh, easily, uh, which allow us to have like our bare metal server and our VMs to communicate together easily without necessarily having to, uh, some extra layer of uh, management. Uh, we keep our operation very lean. We do leverage a VAR. Um, it's very important to get the value added of your VAR. Uh, if you don't have that, you are just getting a reseller, and that's, that's pointless. Uh, for us, they, they do the full rack. They make sure that the color coding is there. They make sure the labeling is there. They make sure that um, uh, the cable are in the right port. And when they don't do that, it gets us upset, obviously. But that, that's what we expect from, from, from a VAR. Uh, and that's important because we want to deliver a full rack. We don't want to go back and say like, oh, this server, we need to add like a bit more memory. We want to add like a bit more disk. It's just become way harder to operate. And if we are at this point of like not knowing what one server needs and not standardized globally, then we are better off going like on public cloud and change our image like from time to time and instance type or something like that. Um, and the other thing is that we, we did acknowledge that we were not in the 90s anymore. Uh, we really tried to leverage any of the technology of the time and try to embrace what was working and, and uh, how we can uh, uh, get our infrastructure fully automated. So there is a lot of code. Our whole pipeline is a CI CD pipeline where we, we can uh, code and automate everything. We leverage a lot like configuration management tools. Um, full Jenkins workflow and things like that. Uh, some of the outcome uh, were like an observed saving of 30% 30, 30 cost saving and a reduced server footprint. Um, 
I heard this morning during the keynote someone mentioning 75% uh, cost saving. I don't know how those people do. Uh, we didn't see that. And when we look at the number and when we are fair we are with our public cloud uh, provider, that means when we include like the headcount that need to be added to uh, building your uh, private cloud solution there in the effort, uh, we only end up to a 30% cost saving. It's still very significant when you spend like a lot of money every month, 30% can mean a lot. Uh, but you have to be fair and think about like uh, the engineering effort you put in it. It's not just the OPEX, it's, it's really like also the, the human resources and all the investment you, you have to do and keep doing uh, to improve your infrastructure. So you need to keep the ongoing R&D effort to make sure your platform is living and evolving. Um, it did give us like clear visibility on what is going on on our stack. Uh, we did learn a lot about our own application, things that we were not able to know and learn uh, easily with, uh, with a public cloud. Uh, we understand better our, our workload, our network traffic, some of the bottleneck, things that were kind of hiding or hard to catch. We, we know uh, uh, are able to find them more easily. Um, the, the, the real bottom line is that you, you need like a strong technical need for it. It, it can't be just cost driven because in, in many cases 30% cost saving may not be enough compared to the, the opportunity or loss of opportunity to not move faster. So you really need to have like a compelling use case for you. And we cannot add that, but now we have new challenges. And, and that's, that's the hyper growth and seasonal traffic peak. Uh, being in house may not uh, allow us to, to answer that. Uh, we have difficult time to do like proper capacity planning. When you grow quickly, when your use case change, you, are, you have like new f features being deployed. Uh, you have a, a big advertising uh, traffic season. Uh, it's become very hard to predict how the business is going to do. And you obviously want it to do like better every time. Um, and you know that you have long delay to procure uh, hardware. So if you know that next week, if, if Two days, uh, a business guy comes to me and tell me like, hey, we have a big deal coming and we are going to a triple business like tomorrow or next week. I won't be able to, uh, to uh, solve this problem with my private cloud deployment unless I plan like huge buffer. Um, so that's where we, we wanted to really implement cloud bursting and make it a reality for us so we can still answer the business use case and can be uh, still uh, uh, able to, uh, to move uh, uh, with the business and not, uh, not uh, prevent the business to grow. So we identified like the compute candidate for us to, uh, that we're able to burst and that's really in our use case, it's uh, the bidding uh, uh, system or the, the bidder and the ad serving system that are the, the uh, legitimate candidate. Uh, we did a POC to validate the feasibility and the POC was very, very straightforward. It may freak out some people, but that was basically just a, a VM on a AWS VPC, um, a bare metal server, a SSHL to tunnel, everything on the same network, uh, and we just put that in our load balancer in, in house and we send the traffic to it and look what's going on. Um, we know that we'll have more latency, we know that uh, things will happen, but it allows us to collect metrics and really understand what, what we are going to get if we want to scale that, what is going to be uh, the impact, like can we truly do cloud bursting? Um, so it was very important for us to measure this service impact. Are we able to deliver the service? Uh, does every cloud provider can answer this need? Uh, if they are like in Oregon and we are in uh, San Jose in, in California, we may add like too much latency. So uh, how do we do that? Measuring this, this uh, data was uh, critical. It allowed us to, to build it at scale and the reality for us, like if we wanted to be able to burst like 20 to 30% of our workload, uh, well, we needed like a 10 gig uh, AWS direct connect with, uh, always on, basically. We, we had to commit to that. So that's, that's become a new baseline uh, on, on our infrastructure. If we want to have bursting capability, we need to have this link ready to be used at any time. Uh, that means you start paying for the 10 gig port every month, even if you don't use uh, your bursting uh, uh, capabilities. Um, we link that directly to our OpenStack network. We just uh, play with some routing and we have like a full AWS VPC that is just dedicated to, uh, to uh, bursting and that's the one on which we are going to, uh, to provision our, our, um, our new compute nodes. Um, we automate all the scanning with Terraform, moving like in 
new, new eras with the new tools that are available to us. Uh, we try to leverage that and improve our system uh, every, every time. Um, and Terraform make it very easy for us to deploy like uh, a, a new set of uh, resources in uh, AWS uh, VPC. And the only thing left to, to be done on our side is just making sure our CI/CD pipeline that deploys the application is still working to be able to deploy uh, in a, a seemingly, seemingly less <laughs> way. Uh, anyway, to deploy uh, easily to, a CI, to the AWS VPC. Um, and from there, we have like a, a, a cloud bursting solution, but there is still some limit, and I kind of uh, touch, uh, touch point on them. Um, you have to understand the constraint uh, of, of, of cloud bursting. Uh, and the network is probably becoming the biggest one. Um, depending on how your uh, private deployment or data center deployment is made, uh, you may have like uh, one gig, 10 gig, 20 or 100 gig uh, pack, but um, this has a hard limit on how much you can uh, put through on your uh, public cloud provider will have this one limit too. Um, uh, I believe the virtual gateway on Amazon has some, uh, some uh, uh, limit on how much bandwidth you can uh, put through. Uh, if you try to uh, leverage um, AWS um, VPN solution, you will have uh, even like a smaller limitation. I think they limit to one gig or something like that. Uh, so there is diff different use cases, like how you are going to implement it. Um, keep it very simple and, and really understand those, uh, those blockers or those, uh, those new limits that may not be like just a CPU or, or the, the unbalance on how your, your, your compute is going to perform on this cloud. So kind of a moot point if you can't even get the traffic going there. Latency is going to be a big one. And the other one is going to be uh, to understand the cost. Um, if you have like a commitment for a direct connect with Amazon, you pay the port, that's great. But then when you start bursting, you also need to pay for the bandwidth. Uh, and that's not bandwidth per gigabit, it's going to be the total bandwidth transferred. And this can be very pricey at some point. So you really need to understand like, what, what am I getting? And uh, is, is a business case really there? The good thing is that, at least for us, it allows us to burst as we need, uh, but, but it's very important to continue to measure service impact. Not all service, like we have some, some of our service where the, the bidding latency is so critical, we can't burst on it. We need that to be close to our data store. We need the two, three milliseconds extra going to, uh, to our cloud provider uh, will be a killer for this, uh, this workload. So we need to make sure we measure constantly and understand like as the application change, as the interaction with the other backend service uh, change, we need to constantly revisit and monitor that um, to make sure that we are bursting services that are okay to burst. So here we are now, uh, 2017. Uh, we expanded our footprint to uh, two new da uh, data center location in US. Uh, we implemented cloud bursting, as I mentioned, in a very simple way and lean way, like we, we have done all the time. Um, and we start to leverage Terraform. Uh, and now I think our next step and now we are going to move with, uh, with our time is really around like SDN containers. Um, that's kind of things that we haven't figured out on our side, but we know that at one point we'll need to be able to uh, deliver this kind of solution to our uh, uh, engineering team to make sure they can uh, keep moving the, the product forward. The bottom line, uh, to me, it's really about uh, infrastructure automation. It's more than just OpenStack. It's more than a container or, or like private or public cloud. It's really about uh, uh, how you automate your infrastructure. Uh, and, and to us, it's really like automate everything, code everything, um, including the network. Uh, there, there shouldn't be any uh, hesitation on that. And all your hardware, like so software, uh, rack and roll. If you really get stuck in this idea of like going to uh, change the memory or the, the disk of one specific server, um, you will not succeed in like a private or hybrid cloud solution. You really need to uh, standardize your, your hardware. Um, what was hard before is no way easier. 
uh, and I think it's, it's important to acknowledge it. What, what may feel like a failure, there was like a discussion this morning on like failure of the private cloud. Uh, I think today it's way easier to do and that's probably uh, an opportunity to look at business use case and make sure that uh, you leverage a, a new technology to do that. Um, at the end, I think it's very important to uh, not uh, lose yourself in a tech trend. Uh, it's very easy to try to get everything. Uh, you need to understand your business use, use case because at the end, uh, if you are not an IT shop, if you are not here to build like a storage solution or a compute solution or a public cloud, uh, you are here to delight your customer and you are here to really serve like the, 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 the business solutions they expect from you. And that's where we, we have been focusing a lot and that, that has been our, our, our motto for a while. And that's it. Any, any question? Yes. You mentioned briefly that some of your applications require uh, some data as input. When you run these uh, workloads in the public cloud, how do you deal with uh, moving data back and forth? Could you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, and that was the biggest limitation we, we saw, and that's something that uh, require like strong collaboration with engineering team uh, because we have this back and forth to the, this big data store. We use Aerospike for the or, or big uh, NoSQL storage solution. So when you have your compute not bursting in the public cloud and you have like all your Aerospike call going back, you add up like 10 millisecond latency just for like one or two call. Um, so that's definitely one of the parameters and that's why we can't burst every workload. Only the ones that is okay to have like a smaller, uh, a little bit higher latency is okay. And the effort for us now is really to work and bring those data to the engineering team and try to be creative, like how we can change the application uh, to, to consider the, those use case. Um, should we have like some, some copy of those data in the public cloud? So instead of going back, it will just use it in, in the public cloud where we are bursting. Uh, that's definitely something we are looking at. Uh, and I, that's one of the challenge of cloud bursting. Yeah. So how often do you burst? How long does it take? And what's the biggest challenge? Is so data? <laughs> um, we started to do cloud bursting like three or four months ago. Uh, and since then, we always have something bursting because we didn't necessarily do the proper capacity planning. Uh, so right now, I will say we are bursting all the time. Uh, but the, the ultimate goal is really to just keep that as a a mitigation plan um, and, and more like for a Q4 season where we have like high peak traffic. Uh, and, and that's not something we expect to use like uh, for a daily peak, for example. That's really like for a big seasonal peak. Uh, yeah. so, so what do you find the biggest challenge in doing that since you've been doing it for three or four months? So the biggest challenge is definitely not like putting it in place. I think the biggest challenge is, is uh, uh, to keep to uh, keep this measure of like the back and forth data, like you, you, your application is really the driver on how efficient and how realistic is the cloud bursting, um, and and that's where like having this discussion and bringing that back to the engineering team to see what are the options, it's probably the difficulty, and the cost aspect of it is not that obvious. So you end up like discovering like oh we are bursting, but no our bill is like. So so is, uh, is that the the cleanup or bringing the state or data? back from the public cloud into your realm? Is, is, it, is it a fair summary or? So, say it again, sorry. Yeah. So then you, you have some state that's, that's in the public cloud, right? At some point you say, I no longer need it or whatever it is. Do you discard the data? Do you bring it back? How do you reconcile? So, so right now we, it's what we burst in a public cloud is completely stateless. Uh, so everything that needs to be stored is going back to the data center, and that's where this big network limitation comes from. Yeah. All right. If there is no more questions. Thank you, everyone.